Hello Geography 232 students, welcome to week nine of our course. This week we're going to be looking at, uh, well further looking at, LiDAR data. So last class we spent our, our time learning about LiDAR data, uh, which is essentially uh, similar to radar. It uses laser pulses to get the distance from an origin to a surface. So we're going to dive deeper into LiDAR data this week, and specifically we're going to talk about the various professional applications where we where we see LiDAR technology deployed. And we will also talk about a very specific uh, task that can be accomplished with LiDAR data, and that is analyzing uh, the amount of incoming solar radiation or insulation uh, that is received on rooftops uh, for the purpose of siting solar panels. So we'll do that uh, in this week's lab, and we'll talk a bit about it in this lecture. All right, so this week's lecture is LiDAR Part 2, Tools and Applications. This week's lab is Estimate Solar Power Potential. And upon completion of this lecture and lab, you should know how to understand the role of light intensity in LiDAR sensing, identify applications for LiDAR data in various professional settings, determine the amount of insulation, incoming solar radiation, received by rooftops using GIS, and then uh, converting that information, we can estimate the power generated by solar panels using GIS. Just a brief outline of uh, what this lecture contains. Uh, first, we'll talk about a specific component of LiDAR data, that's uh, intensity, light intensity, and how LiDAR deals with various uh, reflectivities. Uh, LiDAR applications, that's how is LiDAR data, or LiDAR deployed in various professional settings. Um, mapping incoming solar radiation, how do we map insulation using GIS and LiDAR data, and then finally, what are some additional uh, products that we can create with LiDAR data? And you've had some exposure to that uh, if you've completed the labs in this course. All right, so first, components of LiDAR data, intensity. All right, intensity is a measure of the return strength of the laser pulse that generates a point. So if we're thinking back to last lecture, LiDAR data uses points uh, of light, uh, what we call pulses, and returns. Okay, so the pulse is when the point of light is sent out from the origin, and the return is, just as the name implies, it's the, the light returning back to the sensor. Uh, and so the intensity is the, a measure of the return strength, so the strength of the re re reflectivity of that pulse of light. So it's based in part on reflectivity of the object struck by the laser pulse. Uh, reflectivity is a function of the wavelength used, most commonly near-infrared, which is right at about 1,064 nanometers. Um, a strength of the return varies with the composition of the surface of the object reflecting the return. Now, what that means is that if it is a, a higher albedo, meaning a higher reflectivity, a lighter color, generally speaking, like a white or a light gray, that's going to reflect a higher uh, amount of, uh, of return or reflectivity uh, for, that, for that pulse. A darker color, like dark black asphalt or water, for instance, has a very low reflectivity. So some surfaces are more reflective than others. And then the kind of nuanced reflectivity is in that sort of the, the, the green zone. So different types of vegetation have different types of reflectivity. And so this all goes back to spectral signature and things like that. So how, how much of the, the original pulse is sent back to the sensor is determined by the albedo or the dark or the lightness of the surface that the light pulse strikes. So intensity may be used to aid in feature detection, classification, and extraction. And we talked about that in the last LiDAR lecture. Also, as a substitute for aerial imagery when none is available. So it will be black and white unless the image or the, the LiDAR pulses are classified. Uh, but because of the various reflectivity of surfaces, as you can see in these screenshots here below, it almost looks like an aerial image, but these are actually just varying degrees of reflectivity. You can see the crosswalks on the street are obviously painted white, and so they have a higher reflectivity than the asphalt around them. 
So the intensity is relative and not quantifiable. Therefore, you cannot expect the same value off the same target from flight to flight or from elevation to elevation. Uh, and so what that means is that uh, you might see a relative difference from one surface to the next, but there's not, it's not actually measuring a unique spectral signature as much as is the reflectivity of the surface. And so it's not about uh, specific numbers as much as relative values or you have relative intensity. So a couple of other factors influencing intensity, range and strength of the laser beam. So how far away the laser origin is to the surface that it's striking. So if you're uh, you know, flying in an airplane, the example here, and it's very, very far from the surface, that's going to have an effect on the intensity of the laser. Uh, the strength of the receiver. So some newer receivers have a higher power than older receivers. So the technology itself has an effect. And then also the incident angle, that's the, the angle of declination from nadir. So nadir is directly 90 degrees from the source to the surface. Anything off nadir is what we call oblique. Oblique just means at an angle. Nadir is essentially at a right angle from the ground. So uh, if it's not at nadir, that's going to have a, an effect on the intensity as well. And what this is is just essentially a, a reflectivity uh, or an intensity map. So we can obviously make out different features and structures on the landscape. We can probably guess that what we're looking at has uh, some lakes or some ponds and also maybe some various types of agricultural plots. They look to be sort of rectangular in, in shape. And so we can tell that by the varying degrees of intensity or reflectivity. So not every surface is going to have exactly the same. And things like water have very low reflectivity, whereas lighter colors and maybe more uh, lush vegetation will have a higher reflectivity. In this case here, we can use a color symbology. So instead of a, a dark to light uh, symbology or color scheme, we can apply a color to that, uh, where uh, instead it's a, a blue to red with yellows in between. And so again, it's not an aerial image. It's a actually a LiDAR point, uh, point cloud in this case, uh, but we can kind of simulate what uh, the colors may be. All right, so let's talk a little bit about LiDAR applications. So just a few, this is not a comprehensive list, but a few LiDAR applications you might encounter in the professional world would be land surveying, utilities management, forestry, transportation planning, archaeology, and solar panel placement, which is a, a rising uh, career field, actually. So again, not a comprehensive list, but these are just a handful of examples that I've come up with. So land surveying. Uh, LiDAR sensors can be used to survey the landscape for myriad purposes, tax assessment, architecture and building, research, and so on. UAVs, for example, equipped with LiDAR, have a bird's eye view of the Earth and can provide highly detailed models of the landscape for assessing parcel boundary lines, slope and angle, vegetation, and so on. So essentially there are multiple ways to apply LiDAR data in the field of land surveying. Land surveying is a uh, a profession that has often been inter intertwined with GIS for quite some time and the application of LiDAR data using uh, lasers to to get distances from point A to point B has actually been has a long history in land surveying uh, but this broader uh, application where we're looking at it to actually model the landscape looking at slope and things like that that's a more up-and-coming approach and so it's something to keep in mind uh, as I mentioned before, tax assessment purpose, purposes and parcel boundary checks, those are crucial for um, county and city uh, city planning purposes and you know maintaining a uh, proper tax base by identifying you know where one person's property starts and another person's ends, and so on and so forth. Utilities management. So regular maintenance of power lines presents uh, safety risks to power utilities. So um, speaking from personal experience, working for a power utility company, there are uh, vast amounts of time and effort that go into mitigating risk to the company and to customers. And so any way to minimize potential risk uh, is going to be appreciated. And so LiDAR data is one way of doing such. LiDAR can help identify issues 
in power lines before a person ascends a pole, limiting the risk of falls and electrocution. And so essentially, if there is a potential question, like maybe, you know, a power line goes down or some someone's power goes out, instead of sending a technician up a maybe a dangerous 80 foot pole or, or 100 foot tower, instead, they can send a UAV up there with LIDAR, which can take a very highly, highly detailed model of the structure of the lines of the landscape around it. So utility companies can quickly assess the damage to devise a solution while minimizing risk. Forestry. Forestry is another industry that relies on LiDAR data. So LiDAR equipped drones can be deployed to survey large farms to help deter determine how resources might be used to increase productivity. So essentially we could send out a UAV with LiDAR and find out what types of trees are growing well or thriving in certain environments, which ones are not, is there something that can be done about that, and so on and so forth. LiDAR can be used over forested areas to create 3D models that show the impact of human activity, logging for example. Uh, up in the Pacific Northwest, logging is a major industry, and so there's a broad um, deployment of LiDAR and UAVs up there for the, these purposes. A key advantage of LiDAR is that it can penetrate tree cover, as we talked about in previous lecture. Uh, the LiDAR uh, pulses don't just stop at the top of the canopy, right? They, they descend, they penetrate deep into the canopy all the way down to the ground. And so that allows those first, second, third, fourth returns uh, to, be, to be modeled, visualized on screen. And then we can see you know, what uh, the thickness of the canopy is, how high it is, what the surface looks like below, and so on. Transportation planning. Uh, planners can use LiDAR to help expand mass transit systems, site new rail, rail stations, design freeway expansions, and so on. So a broad application uh, for LiDAR data in transportation planning. UAVs with LiDAR sensors can scan wide areas and generate useful data to help determine plans for future transportation infrastructure. Uh, and so we've got a couple of examples here. Essentially LiDAR data, uh, or I should say LiDAR uh, tools, provide very high precision measurements, right? So it's it's a higher precision measurement than just an aerial image, uh, and maybe even higher than a person on the ground doing a, a surveying. And so transportation planning is another industry that relies on LiDAR. And my last example here is archeology. span So LiDAR is deployed in archeological digs to model plans and aid in future excavations. Uh, LiDAR has been used to identify ancient roads and buildings, fish ponds and infrastructure, religious structures, and so on. Uh, this example I have here on the right is Angkor Wat in Cambodia. And so we have an aerial image on the top, and then we have a LiDAR, uh, I guess, image or visualization uh, on the bottom. And so I just encourage you to pause the video at this point or zoom in on your lecture notes and uh, take a look down there on the south end or the, the bottom of your uh, image, both on the top and on the bottom. Kind of compare the south side of that, that pond um, and you'll notice that there are indeed structures under that are not visible to the naked eye with uh, the aerial image but are visible with the LiDAR. Uh, recreation or visualization. And so that's the really great thing about LiDAR data is because of its high precision and because it can penetrate down to the ground, it doesn't just bounce off the top of the canopy, we can actually see what lies beneath thick, dense jungle and vegetation. So as you can imagine, if you're an archaeologist, there's uh, quite a lot of application there for, for LiDAR data. <clears throat> All right. So for this next section, this uh, feeds directly into this week's lab, measuring insulation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, the mechanics behind measuring insulation using GIS, uh, because your lab does not get into too many of the kind of um, details about why we do it or how the GIS actually does what it does. So we'll talk about that here. So first and foremost, what is insulation? If you've taken a weather and climate class, then you probably already know, but maybe you don't in our GIS class, so let's introduce it. So insulation is actually uh, a combination of three words, incoming solar radiation, insolation. So incoming solar radiation is the primary energy source that drives many of Earth's physical and biological processes. Uh, essentially, it's sun energy. It's energy coming from the sun. So several factors influence the intensity of insulation at any given location. Cloud cover and atmospheric particulate matter, uh, solar declination, that's the angle of the sun relative to the Earth's surface, um, and so you can imagine that would be winter versus summer perhaps, so the sun is higher in the sky in terms of angle during summertime, lower in the sky uh, at noon during wintertime. Latitude, so one's latitude on the Earth's surface. Altitude, so how high one person is. 
and also the land cover. So uh, is there dense, dense vegetation, excuse me, dense vegetation? Uh, is it dry like a desert? Uh, are you on frozen tundra? So the land cover also has an effect on the insulation. Okay, so you can take a look there at that graphic if you want to spend some time on it. It gives you an idea of uh, the Earth's energy budget. So the total amount of energy that is both reflected and absorbed, long wave and short wave. And then the second image there is global horizontal irradiation. So that's essentially the average annual sum of, of radiation in kilowatt hours per square meter uh, over the surface of Europe. And not much of a surprise there. Southern Europe and North Africa obviously receives much more uh, solar radiation than Northern Europe. So topography is a major factor in determining the spatial variability of insulation. Uh, variations in elevation, orientation, so that's slope, the angle of a slope, and aspect, the direction that a surface faces in terms of cardinal uh, directions. And the shadows cast by topographic features all affect the amount of insulation received at different locations. Uh, variability also changes with time of day and time of year. As you can imagine, uh, there's going to be a greater um, intensity of solar energy coming in at noon than there is at 7 o'clock in the morning or 7 o'clock in the evening. And as I mentioned earlier, time of year also has a major uh, role to play. If you're standing outside on the 21st of June, you're going to receive a larger amount of solar energy than if you're standing outside at the same time of day on December 21st. So these variations contribute to microclimate characteristics. Uh, that's why you know you might be on the same line of, of latitude as another city, but its various topography is different, therefore different climates. Uh, microclimate uh, climates affect air and soil temperature, evapotranspiration, that's the amount of moisture that's evaporated uh, through uh, leaves, snow melt patterns, uh, soil moisture, and light available for photosynthesis. So insulation, this is obviously a no-brainer, but insulation originates from the sun, right? So that is the source of all the energy uh, on Earth. Uh, it is modified as it travels through the atmosphere. Uh, it is further modified by, by topography and surface features, as I've discussed, and it's intercepted at the Earth's surface as three different types of radiation, direct, diffuse, and reflected. So direct radiation is, as the name implies, directly uh, intercepted, unimpeded uh, from the sun. So if you're standing or lying on your back staring up at the sun, don't do that, but uh, if you were to close your eyes and lie on your back under the sun, you would feel the, the sun's rays directly on your skin, right? Uh, diffuse radiation is scattered by atmospheric constituents such as clouds and particulate matter, uh, smog, for instance. So it's diffuse. Think about diffusion where the light hits a, uh, a, sore, uh, a, a an object, in this case clouds, and then the light is diffused out. So it, instead of coming directly from the sun, in this case it kind of is spread out and then lastly reflected radiation it's reflected from surface features so maybe off of the ground or off of mountains things like that so the sum of direct diffuse and reflected radiation is called total or global solar radiation so why does it matter how do we actually measure uh, incoming solar radiation using gis well, there actually is a spatial analyst toolbox for measuring solar radiation. It's called the Solar Radiation Tool Toolbox. Um, and it allows you to map and analyze the effects of insulation over a geographic area for specific time periods. Uh, there's two ways of measuring, and these are two separate tools. One is called the Area Solar Radiation Tool, and that measures insulation across the entire landscape. And so that's good for if you want to find out how much um, kilowatt hour energy is uh, generated or received over, we'll say, some surface. If you want to look at uh, where to put uh, solar panels, for instance, and that relates to this week's lab. Or we also have point solar radiation, and that's measuring insulation at a specific XY location. And so maybe in that case, you've identified an, an area solar, using the area solar radiation, you've identified an area that receives more than another area, but you want to find the very specific XY coordinates that receive the most you might want to use area solar radiation and then use point solar radiation tool to zero in on the highest uh, highest amount. So just note that uh, solar radiation tools do not measure reflected radiation in the calculation of total radiation. Uh, therefore, the total radiation is calculated as the sum of direct and diffuse. So the vast majority of insulation comes from direct and diffuse radiation anyway, uh, but just be aware of that. So there's 
there's actually not a way to to measure uh, reflected in GIS. So how do solar radiation tools work? Solar radiation tools perform calculations through the following four steps. So step one is the creation and calculation of an upward looking hemispherical view shed based on topography. And I'll show you a graphic of that momentarily. Uh, step two is to overlay the view shed on a direct sun map to estimate direct radiation. So that's direct radiation. Step three is to overlay the view shed on a diffuse sky map to estimate diffuse radiation. Because remember, total radiation in this case is diffuse plus direct. And then finally, direct sun map and diffuse sky map are combined to calculate the total solar radiation. So this process, process is repeated for every location of interest to produce an insulation map. All right, so step one, create upward looking hemisphere view or hemispherical view shed. So similar to a fisheye lens, which views the entire sky from a single point, uh, it's similar to the view uh, in a planetarium. And so imagine a single point that can see all 360 degrees around it. The amount of visible sky plays an important role in the insulation at that location or any given location. So for example, a sensor located in an open field has, an higher, has a higher insulation value than a sensor located in a deep canyon. So it's, a, it's the amount of sky that is actually exposed from any given location. And so it's not just about the, you know, is it a field versus is it a canyon? Also, is it surrounded by dense trees or tall trees? Or is it low chaparral, low shrubs, things like that? So the amount of sky that is visible from a location is the first, first component that goes into uh, creating the, uh, the hemispherical view shed. Step two is to uh, overlay the view shed on a direct sun map to estimate direct radiation. And so on this graphic here on the right, if you take a look at it, maybe pause the video, zoom in a bit, you can see that it has June 22nd at the top and December 22nd at the bottom. So that tells you summer solstice to winter solstice. And then between there, you have all the various altitudes or, or um, solar declinations, angles of the sun over the course of the year. All right. So as high in the sky as it goes in June and as low in the sky as it goes in December. OK, uh, and then you have hours uh, over the day uh, throughout the day. So direct solar radiation um, originating from every direction is calculated using a sun map in the same hem uh, hemispherical projection as the view should. A sun map is a raster representation that displays the track of the sun over hours of the day and over days of the year. And again, it is um, you know, obviously a direct, direct line where the sun is in the sky. So it's not going to be the entire sky. It's only going to be that those uh, specific angles in the sky given the time of year. So similar to uh, similar, this is similar to you looking up and watching as the sun's position moves across the sky over a period of time. Uh, don't do that. This is a, a dated lecture, as you can tell. All right. So step three, overlay the view shed on a diffuse sky map to estimate diffuse radiation. Again, diffuse radiation originates from uh, from all over the sky uh, because it's diffused from uh, particular matter or clouds. So from all sky directions as a result of scattering by atmospheric components. To calculate diffuse radiation for a particular location, a sky map is created to represent a hemispherical view of the entire sky. So instead of it being, we'll go back a slide, uh, just those um, angles from uh, low in the sky to high in the sky where the sun is given the time of year, it's over the entire uh, viewable, that the entire fisheye uh, lens location, right? The entire 360 degrees. So the sky map is divided into a series of sky sectors defined by zenith and azimuth angles. So the final step is to combine the direct sun map and the diffuse sky map to calculate the total solar radiation. The viewshed raster is overlaid with a sun map and a sky map rasters to calculate diffuse and direct radiation. The proportion of visible sky area in each sector is calculated by dividing the number of unobstructed cells by the total number of cells in each sector. And allowances are made for sky sector partially obstructed by topography. So you can see here the grayed out area on the right would be areas that are uh, obstructed by topography, but there are still, still portions of cells that um, are, are partially partially obstructed. So uh, essentially they receive a prorated amount of energy. So how does it all uh, pan out once you actually run these tools? Well, we end up with something that looks like this. So the solar radiation measured here is in uh, watt hours per square meter. 
or if we've got a uh, larger scale, so a higher amount of incoming solar radiation, maybe it's kilowatt hours per meter square. And that's actually the measurement that's used to, uh, to calculate the amount of energy that uh, solar, panel, solar panels will be generating on your rooftop, for example. So it all turns into something like this. So the, the greens here represent a higher watt hours per meter square. The orange colors are a lower uh, wattage. And so again, the factors involved here would be the angle of the surface. So the rooftop angle, uh, is it facing north? Is it face, facing south? Is it flat? Uh, are there uh, obstructions like trees around? And so on and so forth. All right, finally, what are some other LiDAR products? And these are going to be uh, familiar to you from last week's lecture. So LiDAR point cloud data, those are all returns, first, second, third, fourth, and so on. And with that, you essentially can create like a wireframe model of a landscape, a really high detailed model. Uh, LiDAR first returns, that would be a digital surface model. So that would be the landscape plus man-made objects and, and um, natural features like trees, um, buildings, things like that. Um, intensity, which we talked about this week. So that would be uh, how reflective the surface is. So water is a lower intensity than um, uh, asphalt and um, concrete is a higher intensity than asphalt as well. And so basically the, the sum would be a light to dark map with the darker colors representing lower intensity and lighter colors representing higher intensity. And last example here is a DEM, digital elevation model, which is just ground returns. So again, surface model includes man-made and natural features on the landscape elevation model is just the, the elevation itself. And as we learned from last week's lab, we can use LiDAR data to derive building footprints, which we did so successfully last week. Uh, we can create contour lines. And we can also measure volume, volumetric changes over time. So I have an example here. This is of Mount St. Helens eruption in 2004. So there was an erup eruption in 2004, and not a lot of people uh, remember this. It obviously was not as uh, catastrophic as the 1980 eruption, but in, 19, in 2004, a, a little uh, little dome started to build in the center of the caldera of Mount St. Helens, and over the course of, I think, a half a year, uh, it just grew and grew and grew, and eventually it blew its top. So with LiDAR data, uh, they're able to measure the size of this little dome. So in this case here, we have September 3rd uh, through November 20th. On September 3rd, we can see a little blip. And as you track across, you see that blip gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then finally on, what was the date? October 1st, uh, is that when it blew? That was the day of the eruption. So then you can see the kind of the effluence there after, after uh, October 1st. So it grew and then it finally blew its top again. Uh, and all the different changes in volume within the caldera were able to be measured with LiDAR data. Same thing applies when measuring, for example, landslides. So landslide material, again, it's, it's measurable. It's a volumetric uh, measurement. And so here we can see a, a false color of remote sensing image. And you can kind of make out there in the center right, there seems to be some kind of uh, you know, the stuff that's come down the side of that hill, that would be trees and mud, things like that, that have flown into the river. And so if we take that same area and we apply a LIDAR measurement to it, we see it before and we see an after. See the little area around the circle. So all of the stuff here that the flow, the flow of material that flowed down the hill uh, is visible right there. We can also take measurements, high to low. So this is actually finding out uh, how oops, the, the volumetric measurement, so before and after. And this is just in black and white. And then here's a classified rendering. So inundated areas, water, tree canopy, and low vegetation. All right, so on that, I will sign off for this week. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out and have a great week. Bye-bye.